I am uh, Thomas Grip, creator, director at Frictional Games and designer of Amnesia The Dark Descent. We set out to make a great horror game and realized we could trick the players into scaring themselves. I think we need to go back to what we made with Penumbra first, because this was really our first lesson. The Penumbra franchise is very simplified, a first person Silent Hill game with less emphasis on the, the weapons aspect of it all. Mainly we're doing is focusing more on the puzzles and stuff like that. The Penumbra franchise really started out as an engine tech demo. We had a course in a university, a master's degree really, and I just used the time to make my own engine. And then we tried making a, a horror game around that with some physics interactions and so on. That whole thing came about. Um, the reason why we had these physics interactions was that, well, we didn't have time to do animations and stuff like that, so it just felt like, well, this is an easy way of, of doing these things when you have drawers, opening, and so on and so forth. And then we figured out, as we put that into the game, that, wow, this is actually quite useful. You know, the, we can do puzzles and other cool stuff with this. So we made a demo that had that physical interaction, a bit of horror atmosphere, released that, didn't think it was going to be anything, but then that actually got quite a bit of uh, downloads. This was back in 2006 and we got a million downloads I think at uh, download.com and then we we're like wow we should probably try and make something commercial out of this. So in nine months which is a uh, thinking back at it, I'm not sure how we managed to do it in that short of time, we managed to uh, put together Penumbra Overture from scratch basically, except from the engine. And that was a first person game with horror elements and puzzles, influenced by uh, Silent Hill and uh, those sort of games, but we wanted to make it in first person. and. Like uh, our decision to use physics, uh, the first person came about from us not having many resources. This is a common theme for the company, really, that we're like, okay, we can't, we can't do an animated character. So we can have it first person instead, because then we can just do away with all of that complicated things. And so first person it was, even though we were very influenced by third person games. The first Penumbra game, you had weapons. You had like a pickaxe, a hammer, fairly crappy weapons uh, to be fighting the demon dogs uh, that were present in that game. But players still used them. So our first thinking was well, we should invest time in order to make the combat better. So if we could have, say, we talked about the Zelda Honan mechanic, we could circle the monster and so on and so forth. But then it hit us that what other first person combat games are out there? One of those was Condemned. And we were like, well, this is a big studio. They have lots of animation, lots of time having tweak these systems, we're not going to be able to compete with this. We're a small company, we're three people at the time of making Penumbra. So we thought, well, could we just remove it? Could we not have weapons? And we just tried it. It was pretty easy doing that because we could just use all of the code we had for monsters already. And it worked. And Nowadays, that doesn't feel like such a big a surprise. There's tons of other games that have weaponless uh, horror. But at the time, there wasn't a lot of those. And I certainly hadn't played anything first person weaponless myself. So I was like, well, this is actually working. So we then could design the whole game around that. And what came about was that players thought it was scarier because it opened them up more to this. The, when they didn't have any weapons, they didn't think about enemies as something to overcome by combat. They thought about them 
in different ways. When they had heard footsteps, they thought about where am I going to go hide? Where can I run? And so on. They used emotions and intuitions and ways of thinking that were all much more tightly connected to what a protagonist in a horror story would do. So this was a great thing for us. If you watch a horror movie, what really happens is that you don't have a protagonist that's on a killing spree. They don't run around killing every monster that comes uh, comes into view like you do, like you often do in Resident Evil or in Silent Hill. Instead, they just run away, hide, and if the monster is, they have no other option. The monster is near. They might launch at it and then make a run for it. So that was the sort of feeling that we wanted to recreate uh, with our game. The idea was that you shouldn't rely on combat in order to overcome any obstacles such as monsters or whatnot. And combat should really be a last resort. And this was what we felt a bit uh, like an evolution of what you have in Silent Hill and those sort of games. So in the second Penumbra game called Penumbra Black Plague, we actually removed the, the weapons, a gameplay system that we had like put tons of effort into it. Uh, and it turns out the game got better of that. And that was something that sort of stuck to our minds. I don't think we really learned from it at the time, um, but it was going to come back uh, later on as we were making Amnesia, that sort of idea that you can remove stuff and actually get a better experience. That sort of sums up the, the Penumbra games. There's uh, puzzles, there's horror, and there is uh, monsters, but you don't have a lot of uh, things where you can combat them with. One one thing though that's also important to note here I think is that the last Penumbra game which was really just a short expansion was called Penumbra Requiem and Penumbra Requiem was us getting a bit tired of making these sort of games and the reason we were tired was because when you make a game like Penumbra you have to intricately design every single situation. You have a puzzle, you have an environment, there's a story. All of those things have to be connected. Once you've put all that effort into doing that, you couldn't reuse it. You have to think of another puzzle, you have to continue on your story and so on and so forth. So we had very little in reusable gameplay elements. And Panama Requiem and later on the start of Amnesia was, was us thinking, well I think we can make games simpler than this. We're, we're doing it the hard way. We could have mechanics like in Super Mario where you have bouncing platforms and moving platforms and power-ups and so on that we can use uh, instead. Something similar like that that we can do uh, um, and then reuse those throughout the games. So Penumbra sort of started out like the first two games were the, the horror puzzle guy, uh, type and then later on we had this more gameplay focused one. I know one of the games that I was really influenced in uh, was uh, Silent Hill 2 had made, uh, or Silent Hill 1 even, had made uh, great marks on me. There was just something about that game and how it uh, frightened me that we were trying to recreate. And then another thing was also text adventures. And I've been playing these for quite some while and I was still quite into it. And what I liked about text adventures is that their puzzles made sense. So in Resident Evil, you and then and, and for that matter, the Silent Hill games, you have like a piano that you have to uh, push some keys on, and then a door opens. Why does that happen? No one knows. It's just a very like it doesn't really belong to the world. But these text adventures, they were all about making their puzzles belong with the world. And they also have these vivid descriptions of environments and, and so on. And I was like, could we do that in a, in a, in a 3D game like with uh, Silent Hill and so on? So that was the, the frame of mind that uh, current moment, I think. 
At the time when we started making Amnesia, the team was four people. It was I who did programming, design mostly. Then uh, the other guy who co-founded Frictional Games, Jens, he did sounds and also some programming. We had another tech programmer and the 3D artist. So four people in total and that was basically the entire team and apart from that we also had some outsourcers like a musician and uh, some firms that were doing 3d models for us but overall like us just us four people for most of the development i think we added one person over development but that was it so a very small team None of us were working at an office. We were all working from home. We actually never met at all, except for me and Jens. The team never met during any time of the production of uh, Amnesia, which I think is not uh, um, how it's uh, normally done. Work began on Amnesia sometime in 2008 after we were done with uh, our game called Penumbra Black Plague, which was a sequel to another Penumbra game. We wanted to do something differently. We were actually at this time growing kind of bored or tired is the right word of doing games which were all about stories and puzzles and those sort of things. And we were thinking we should try and do something that were revolved more around some gameplay mechanics and stuff like that than less about the customizing every single uh, puzzle and location to a specific uh, gameplay. Could we do something that was, in a sense, easier to make? That's actually how our like, first thoughts on Amnesia started out. We didn't start Amnesia thinking, wow, the Penumbra games is a good start, let's make them better. We're more thinking, well, we've learned some things in how to make first-person games, but can we make them simpler? So we actually tried to take a few steps back when we started with Amnesia and we thought, well, in the Penumbra games, it's all of this sort of very, they're not very replayable. Um, environments, you can't do much in environments. There's not a lot of gameplay for the player. It's mostly puzzles that revolve around some very simple mechanics. So we thought, well, the next step would be now to just try and get rid of much of these sort of puzzles as we have done them in the past and figure out new mechanics that we can use in order to fuel like really exciting gameplay that is going to be replayable that is going to be reusable and that's just going to feel more like a game and i personally was very inspired by super mario specifically super mario 64 in how you can collect stars you can go back to locations and you can increase how much you find and that was really attractive to me in in the sense that well we can do this intricate environment and reuse it for because in the past we've done an intricate environment put a lot of effort into it and the player had like been there for two minutes and then walked on to the next environment and that felt like a waste and i liked there to be more gameplay and more exploration possibilities so when we started amnesia the big focus was on okay what sort of gameplay can we do in a horror game that still uh, retain this sort of feel and I remember early design documents talking about situations like there being you enter a cell and there is a guy chained to something at the end of the cell and there's a bunch of traps and there might be some information you want from this guy and the game would then play out you trying to figure out the way to beat the traps and there might be other goodies along the way there might be secret notes, uh, some sort of power up, I don't know, magical amulets, uh, weapons and, and so on that the player could use and that 
we could like have this cool environment for the player to find our way around in. And that's really the thing where we started. And then we tried having that idea, we try and make figure out various mechanics that we can use to achieve that vision. Our lack of funds at that point in time actually made us think more clearly about things. When starting out the amnesia initially, one, we were tired of making these penumbra games. So we wanted to make something different. We wanted to have proper gameplay loops and we were envied of games that had that. We wanted to make a game like Super Mario we can reuse and stuff like that. Also, secondly, we wanted to impress the publisher. We wanted to make a game or talk about the game that we can easily present in terms of gameplay mechanics and so on and so forth. And those two things combined made us very attached to the initial thing. And we didn't want to go in any other direction because we had signed a contract on this and so on. But then the contract broke down and as we were running out of money, we like thought, okay, what do we know we're good at? Because making the game we're currently making is not working. None of the ideas are working. Um, but what could we do? And at that point, actually, um, we got a breakthrough money-wise. Our publisher wondered if we wouldn't want the Penumbra uh, games in a Steam sale. And we were like, we had the games on Steam now, they weren't selling that much on Steam. And we thought the Steam sale, what's that? Well, we sell it for a fourth of the price and we we're like, fourth of the price? We have to sell four times much as many games? We're never gonna do that, that's insanity. But okay, let's try it, let's try it. We're running out of money anyway, so let's try it. And turns out we sold like a hundred times more than, than usual. We actually made more money at that single weekend than we had made throughout the existence of the company almost. Uh, at least when it comes to digital sales. We were like, wow, now we have money. We have enough. If we just reduce the pace a bit, we have enough to reach the goal. We should be able to reach the goal with that money uh, if we can get some extra at the end and so on. So then we thought, okay, let's now we gotta make something that we're good at. And we knew we were good at making uh, the Penumbra games. We had made them fairly quickly um, at a high cost in terms of how much time we spent and nights and so on spent, but still we knew we could make them. We knew players liked them. So now our mantra was, okay, it's gonna be like the Penumbra games, but better. This was in summer 2009, something like that, a year before Amnesia was about to be released. And this also also made us think, okay, let's cut corners. Let's, let's not make any expensive decisions. Let's not make up anything new. Let's again, think about how we made with Penumbra Black Plague and remove combat. Could we have that concept? Could we apply that to something else? And suddenly we were using that for the sanity system. We were using that for how we handle death in the game and so on and so forth. We applied that to as many aspects of the game as we possibly could. So the things that we thought the game needed were actually taking away from the experience. And then when we were running low on funds, this pushed us into another direction. So, an important concept when designing a game is game loops. So very basically, a game loop is how the player interacts with something specific in the game. Very typical example of a game loop is in Super Mario, you have hole at the bottom of the screen for the early, and then they have to learn how to jump across. It. So that's very simple. The player understands there is some sort of obstacle. They have certain verbs or 
actions at their disposal in Super Mario, that's jumping. And then they might have various ways of approaching it. So in Super Mario, you might run and jump, or you might jump on to a higher point and then get across it all. And the idea is that the player sees a problem and then tries to think of a way of getting around that problem using the verbs we usually call actions, player has at hand, jumping and so on, verbs when you talk about game design. And they use what they have at hand in order to overcome it. And then the game loop starts over. So in Super Mario, there's many chasms that you have to jump across. In a game like uh, Dark Souls, there's many monsters you have to defeat uh, along the way and so on and so forth. So when we started out Amnesia, one thing that we searched for a lot was game loops. So we, the classical way of doing game loops is that you have a system that represent the game loop. So if you have a monster, for instance, say in Dark Souls, that monster is going to have AI, it's going to have attack patterns, it's going to exist there. What you see in terms of what the player sees with it having a weapon, with it moving, all of that is there as a system in the code. There's programming codes telling the monster to move, to stab with their sword, and so on and so forth. And then the player is going to react to that with the, the verbs that they got and so on. So we wanted to create these sort of things. And one of the ways we were doing that was with light puzzles. Light puzzles failed because it didn't retain the horror atmosphere that we wanted, but we still wanted to search for this. We wanted to make sure that we had these sort of classical systems in place that the player could play with and then get these sort of game loops going. So early on in Amnesia we tried a ton of different things um, that we thought was going to be uh, able to do this for us and get a game then that had lots of gameplay. At the time, the art movement in games, it had existed for a while, but it started to grow at that time. I remember, for instance, Tale of Tales having released a game, uh, The Path, not, not too long ago. At first, I didn't really get the idea of art games. And they had also released a sort of manifesto that they called the Not Games Manifesto. And first time I read it, I thought it was, to be honest, like bullshit. I was like, this is, this doesn't make any sense. This is just artsy fartsy people. But then when we like were at this moment in time, had start to rethink amnesia and a lot of the things they were saying but in different words was that when you remove gameplay, you actually add something to the game. And then it clicked for me. So I read this from, I went from thinking like these people are, you know, artsy fartsy people. They have nothing to, to add. I'm not interested in this. They do their thing. I do my thing to thinking, wow, I have so much in common of these people. That triggered me to write more about this, about uh, games. I wrote a blog in 2009, something about how gameplay is killing games uh, as a sort of my own take on the whole not games uh, manifesto. And then after reading that, that sort of reprogrammed me and uh, other people on the team to like, okay, so now we're like the artsy people, not really, but now we're gonna make something that's intuitive. So we actually thought about decisions um, in the game in the sense, well, is this really experimental enough? Are we really taking this as far as we can? And death is one of those things. I remember Jen saying, well, you just wrote this, and yet we have this classical notion of you die and then you replay, isn't that like against what you just wrote? And like, oh yeah, you're right, we should, <laughs> we should totally not have death. And there was all of these things, we had um, sanity potions uh, later on, I know someone complained about it, I think in some preview, and like, 
this is not a company or let's remove the sanity potions so just having had our mindset that we were gonna be the ones that broke the sort of mold also le led us to make more drastic decisions and just improve upon the design really so reading that manifesto at that time like that came at rereading that for me came at the perfect time and really nailed down what we had to do in order to succeed with amnesia there was a bunch of these false starts when uh, starting Amnesia. The, the, the whole production was filled with them. And one of them that I remember was light puzzles. So we thought the game is a horror game. And we know from the past that the play between light and dark is very important for creating good horror. So the next idea then was, which felt obvious, why not make gameplay based around light and darkness? And it felt like this was gonna be great. So we uh, envisioned uh, the player having uh, uh, different light sources, opening windows and uh, putting fires into uh, fireplaces, uh, lighting up lamps and, and whatnot in order to create light environments that the player would then be safe in. And then perhaps they could redirect the, the light uh, to corridors and so on and we could build around cool puzzles with that so say that the player wanted to go from A to B but there was a lot of darkness in between they could light a light source there perhaps throw another light source into another location and uh, they could have a mirror where they light it up in some other place and if there is a monster they could hold that back by uh, putting up other light sources and so on. This was actually partly inspired by a PS1 game that I never got to play, um, but I read some walkthroughs when it's so an obscure uh, Japanese game called The Note, which I'm, I don't think many people have played that game. I learned it from another friend who specializes in these sort of, uh, of obscure Japanese games. Um, Anyways, that had similar mechanics and we, and we felt I hadn't played that game, but I only, I only read walkthroughs and it's like, this sounds cool, let's do this. So we started designing levels, but it start, has started to hit us that this isn't working. And the thing is that when you do a horror game and play with light and darkness, the important factor is what emotions that trigger. So you need to have, say, this, Typical example is say you have a sci-fi game and you have flickering lights through a corridor and perhaps a monster appearing Then the flickering lights together with the monster create the cool mood of shadows playing around and so on and so forth But as you start making it into gameplay you have to be more careful in how you do these atmospheric things so one thing that we discovered was that for instance you have to be fairly clear on what constitutes shadow and what constitutes light. You can't have many gray areas, that's going to be very hard to play a game like that. So you need to be, this is lit, this is dark, in order to, for the player to like run a gauntlet through the light areas. But that looked crap, that didn't look scary, it, it, it felt artificial and, and so on. So we we just went through a couple of quick designs and then decided that well we won't be able to have this sort of gameplay so we were extremely disappointed because talking it through it sounded great like this was uh, uh, the sort of mechanic we wanted but when we tried to create a horror game with that mechanic we like we only got the mechanic we didn't get the horror game so we couldn't have those two working together and that was you know something that didn't go at all as we had hoped it would. Okay, so then we started thinking, okay, so light and dark is not gonna work like directly as a gameplay system. So we thought, what would? And then, well, the player could perhaps just lose sanity to this. So we don't have any clear gameplay loop here, but if there is something just generally bad 
about being in the dark, such as you losing your sanity, um, which is uh, something that had been in other games. So we went with that and, and, and we, tried, we tried that out and uh, it worked much better because once we were not forced to have this very stark contrast between light and dark, between failure and success in terms of you moving around an environment but could have like a more fuzzy, the player loses sanity here but not here and the player could like imagine what was happening, that's a dark corner and so on, then that opened up their imagination more and it made us it easier for us to construct scary environments. And then we sort of, again, we didn't learn as much as we thought we would, um, but because what we thought then was, wow, sanity is a great game mechanic. So let's base the game around sanity. So one of the big components in Amnesia was our sanity system. The sanity system is interesting. What we're trying to achieve with the sanity system is some form of mechanic that the players can easily intuit. That's a concept uh, behind a lot of this sort of facade gameplay loops that we're trying to achieve here in that the players need to be able to easily play along with them. It's, if it's a very complicated concept, players are not gonna understand it. Then they have to, need, uh, have to have it explained. What we want is to have a few simple cues and then let the players do the rest. When it comes to the sanity system, an important bit there was for the players to just get the idea that the protagonist, uh, Daniel, he's afraid of the dark. He's gonna be mentally unstable if he stays into the dark for too long or looks at scary things, in this case monsters and corpses, for too long as well. So players need to be, uh, stay out of those things. If you were low on sanity, you, you got slower and there was other gameplay factors into it. We added special items the player could find sanity potions in order to increase your sanity. And we felt, well, if we have the sanity mechanic, like darkness could be an enemy, the player would have to play with this um, in order to progress in the game. But then it turned out that players didn't like that at all and um, because there was really hard time having the right balance here so players for instance some players were too much in the darkness had very low sanity for a big part of the game had real tr issues um, completing it other people were really good at avoiding the darkness and then you know, the spooky environments and all the ambience we were trying to build up so they didn't get a, a scary game experience and the game got too easy for them. So we had balance issues. And again, we went back to the lesson that we learned all the way back in Panamera was that does this need to be in the game at all? Could we just throw out all gameplay aspects of the sanity? So what we did was that sanity was still a number, player could still go insane, hallucinate and so on and uh, eventually collapse on the ground from lack of mental health. But that didn't influence the game at all. If the player collapsed, could get up and, uh, and continue going. So there was no balancing need for us anymore. It was just the, the whole sanity thing and the whole light and darkness thingy, which we way back when we started out the game thought of being this gameplay loop where you, the player has expectations on uh, how it's gonna work and what verbs they're gonna be using and so on. And we have a very, strict system that controls it all and as the player learns more about this system just as you learn more about chasms in Super Mario or monsters in uh, Dark Souls you get better at playing that so instead we had basically nothing <laughs> we had a sanity meter we had some sanity effects and then there was no real fail state and it worked better and this was sort of crazy uh, 
to us uh, that we could just throw things out and it all worked better. And then we don't really say what the consequences are for this. But the player assumes, right, if you're going to lose your mind, I'm not going to be able to play him. He might die, he might, you know, be harder to control, he might attract the attention of monsters, and so on and so forth. I even think that if I'm not mistaken, it was long ago since I went through all of this, there's a hint that says, if you go too insane, monsters are going to have an easier way of finding you. This is a lie. There's no logic at all like that in the game, but we're planting an idea into the player. What really is happening in the sanity system is that it's a meter, it goes down as you're looking at certain things and as the player is in the darkness uh, for, for too long. If it hits certain levels, we're gonna play certain effects. There's a library of what we call sanity effects that just plays up randomly when you're at a certain level, say if you're below 0.5 insanity, certain effects are gonna come online and so on. Then if you reach zero, you come to the end state where you collapse you go up and regain some sanity. They're not gonna go fully recharged, but have a little left. Um, but since the meter is so obscure, players are not gonna understand exactly what happened. They're don't, not gonna see it as a reset, they're just gonna see I was really close to losing it there. Got some sanity left. And they're gonna continue thinking about it like that. But what in reality is happening is that we saw, wow, the player went down to zero insanity. We gotta make sure that doesn't happen too often. So instead of doing it like before, having a system that's a competitive system, something for the player to beat, we have what we call an ambient system, which is just there to provide a certain experience for the player, which in this case is the feeling that they're going slightly insane of doing certain things and because of that has an aversion for these things, which is monsters and darkness. So really there's a system in, in place to keep the player at a certain level of sanity, but for the player they see it as a fight of remaining sane. But in reality, the game always makes sure to have them at a certain spot. So you can really just play the game in any way you like, almost, and you're gonna have the same amount of insanity drop to check, you know, for the game as a whole. Um, but players are not gonna notice that. So they're playing, they're playing the game based on totally different rules from what there really is underlying this gameplay loop. And I think that's probably the clearest example and something that's not very common in game design because in game design you usually think about it as the player learns the gameplay systems, the code that is there to control how things behave in the game and as they get better at doing this, the game, they get better at playing the game. But in our game, in Amnesia specifically, there is nothing to, uh, to learn and really learning the system is gonna make the game worse. So it's all a facade and our hope is not letting the players like look behind the curtains and see what's really going on. So very much like uh, how a magician would set up their show and stuff like that. If you know how the tricks are done, show is not very interesting. But when you see the magic trick done, you think, well, he made an airplane disappear. And that's interesting. What's not so interesting is perhaps that he just put up a mirror and made it look like an airplane disappeared. But it's when the audience think that something happens and plays along with that, that's when the magic happens. The reason why we want to build up this facade is while systems might sound better because you're actually recreating the things, is that they're not very stable and they can't represent what the player think is there. So take a monster. A monster is something that is, they're walking around in an environment and doing different things. In the player's mind, they're thinking 
when they first know about the monster's existence, that it has certain wants and needs, that it's trying to spook the player, that it has certain abilities and so on. This is a very vivid imagination that's also extremely potent. Not only what the player thinks, but also what's unknown to them. They might not know what the monster is capable of. And not knowing that, not being sure what the monster can do, is a great component for scaring them. I've read it at least in a Stephen King book, uh, Dance Macabre, an example of this, which is that you learn that there's a monster behind a door, but you're not sure what it is, and you think, wow, it, it could be a, a 10 meter cockroach or something like that. And then you open the door and you see it's a 10 meter cockroach and you exclaim, oh my God, I'm so relieved that it's not a 100 meter cockroach. Once you get a clear grip on things, they get less scary. Systems in normal gameplay loops are meant to be understood. So we also know this this with the light and dark gameplay and other early attempts that we did with enemies roaming around was that once we had these sort of normal gameplay mechanics going on, players got a better understanding of how they worked and that sort of fantasy components, the imaginary, the extremely potent monster that was inside of their heads, that vanished. And what remained was this more abstract, boring monster where they knew their systems. So when we had a facade, the player didn't know what was on the other side. He imagined all of that. And that imagination contained unknowns, and really unknowns because there weren't knowable, there weren't any systems that could provide these answers for the player, and as such they became a lot more potent than anything we could do systemically. And we figured this out in, in many cases, similar with the sanity system and so on and so forth. The moment the player understood how something worked, it broke down a bunch of the fantasy and it didn't become as exciting and scary as it was when it was this imaginary idea in our player's head. What we like came to realize, players normally have a um, limited scope of attention. So players, if they're like hunting, they, they have weapons and are uh, trying to fight monsters, their attention is going to be on that. And then they have very left over for noticing details in the environment and stuff like that. But now that we started throwing out things and the player really didn't have much gameplay systems to think about, the players started to pay more closely attention to small things like footstep sounds. Normally in a game, if there is a background noise playing, players don't pay much attention to it because they're like, okay, is this gonna be a fight? No, this is, uh, or, or, you know, it doesn't really contain uh, um, any of the, the things they're used to when it comes to monster encounters or jumping chasms. But now that we didn't have a lot of systems for the player to be engaged in, a slight sound was for the player like, wow, okay, what could that be? Um, what sort of monster could that belong to? Because their attention was freed up. So they're just imagining a whole bunch of stuff. It was sort of like a, a sensory deprivation tank, you know, when you lower someone into a tank of water and they can't hear anything, they can't really feel their own body. And lying in there for some people, it just takes a very short time to start hallucinating. And that's what we found our own players doing. They were walking through these environments. We didn't give them any systems to interact with. And they started making up things on their own. Slightest sound, a monster is near. Was that a shadow there? Perhaps someone is stalking me and so on and so forth. I've seen gameplays later on of Amnesia of, of players hiding in closets and playing out the horror story for like 
one guy was easily playing around the map for half an hour, hiding, peeking around corners at was what was basically nothing. Just the setup, the setting, and a few sound cues made him basically roleplay a horror situation. I remember him saying that he had seen a YouTube video, we had a trailer, our first gameplay trailer, I think, had the, the protagonist in that trailer hiding in a closet. So he was set on, this was the hiding closet game. So every single location, he like, okay, there's a closet, I'm gonna hide in that. Was that a sound? Gotta go in the closet and hide. He was doing that uh, all by himself, which was great. A pretty common occurrence and something that we've seen um, examples on YouTube is uh, players that have had no threats in the environment at all and they're still role-playing this horror experience. They're hiding in closets, looking uh, behind corners and so on. Even though there are no monsters around, they could just waltz through the map. And yet, because of sounds and the whole atmospheric buildup, they feel less they're threatened and need to do these things and are basically making up this horror story all on their own. And they were thinking that all of this was made from the game. We've had players also just staring into a wall and having like the scariest, uh, you know, very scary and exciting time just doing that because they were thought that a monster was nearby and so on and so forth. So just some music cue, a sound cue and the right atmosphere just gave them uh, this entire experience. What really is happening in the game is that we build up a facade um, that there are certain things happening where in fact they're not. And this all, again, it's different from other games where you have a system actually represent what you have. In, again, Super Mario, there's gonna be a system that represent a Goompa walking around on the ground, obviously, and there's gonna be systems if you jump on top of him, certain things are gonna happen. If he walks into you, you're gonna die, and so on and so forth. But a lot in Amnesia, none of these systems exists. So what we do a lot is that we, for instance, have a couple of footsteps that we play. And then the player will notice them and build up a picture. They might have read a note that describes this. They might have seen a glimpse of a type of monsters earlier on in the game, or it might have been a painting or whatnot. It's just something that sort of triggers the player to imagine that those sounds belong to something. And the player then will act upon as if that is true. Just like if you have in a theater play a facade of a, a saloon or a forest, the actors will act as if they are in one of those places. So by tricking, whereas those actors in a play know that it's all a facade, in Amnesia, the players are not aware that that's a fact. Even players that know how the game ticks, most of them are gonna still be affected, even knowing that, you know, that's just the sound effect playing. Then they're like, you're saying that, but can I really be sure? Because when it comes to these sort of things that the player makes up a, a mental imagery of a threat, they're very likely to act upon the, that threat. It's like you imagining some sort of threat in, in your life that something might happen and someone might say, well, the, the likelihood of that is, is very small. So what you're perceiving is not really true. But once the idea has gotten into your head, it's very hard to get it out of there again because you're like, well, it could be true. It's sort of like in, in the past of our evolution, if we saw swaying grass, that could be a sable-toothed tiger jump, waiting there to pounce us, or it could be the wind. People who were skeptics all the time and thought that, well, that's probably the wind. I, I'm not gonna fall for that. 
they were more likely to be eaten by sable-toothed tigers <laughs> because they were not acting on their fears. Whereas the more superstitious people who were like, well, I'm not going to take a risk, they got eaten by, uh, they were less likely to be eaten by sable-toothed tigers, um, got more children, and that's the sort of people we are now. We are the people who, if we say waving grass, we're going to assume that there is a sable-toothed tiger making those movements because that's the sort of our grandfather, that's the grandfathers that survived back in the past. So building upon that instinct is like crucial for creating uh, the horror that we did in Amnesia. One thing that inspired me, I'm guessing this is a combination of a lot of things. I really like old uh, movies, uh, old horror movies like The Haunting. And I also like reading about uh, old scientists from the 18th and um, 17th century. And a lot of these stories take place in these old castles. And this old, damp, uh, uh, not very well lit castle filled with cobwebs and creaking floorboards and rain pounding on the window, trees swaying outside or slapping on the windows and so on. All of that was something that felt like a very interesting atmospheric place to be in. It was also something that I felt many people would recognize, like you say haunted castle and people instantly know what you're talking about. So it felt like if we could just have the right cues early on to say that you're in a spooky castle. They're gonna know from the get-go what sort of experience is expecting of them. And with that comes all sort of expectations from them of what's gonna be in this environment. So obviously there's gonna be things lurking around and there's gonna be creepy sounds and there might be ghosts or might be ghouls and whatnot. And all of that is extremely good for us because if we can have more of a cliche is not the right word but a familiar environment that people have seen in other media and be scared by they're gonna have an easier time getting into the right mood we don't have to explain as much we can just you know you're in this place and people are gonna understand that and understand the role that they have to play so a lot of effort was trying to get, with the limited resources that we had, trying to get this uh, castle feeling. And we actually went on, I think this is the only research trip we ever done to Frictional. Um, we're sort of lucky from where I live, there's a bunch of castles. I have just, you just take a boat trip and you're um, at the castle where uh, the, the play Hamlet uh, was supposed to taking place and that has uh, uh, catacombs and uh, that sort of thing. So we were all in all of these environments and we could not only take photos and get a sense of how it would look like trying to recreate that. We can also walk around in them and soak up the atmosphere and like, oh, this is interesting, this sort of corridor. Oh, I liked how it turned over there. Oh, the light here was very dim. And this sort of lamp gives off an interesting glow. So we could use that as a very good inspirational source for building up the castle that you've seen in Amnesia. So the Amnesia castle is sort of like a distillation of that research trip and my memories of old movies and reading about biographies of uh, scientists. We took a lot of what we learned from Amnesia and used that for our next game, Soma. My major takeaway from making Amnesia is a deeper understanding just how game mechanics or that may or may not be there 
shape how the player experiences things. For me personally, I had more like a classical way of thinking about it, like you had a system, that system does things, and didn't really think past that, even though we made horror games made on atmosphere and so on. But with Amnesia, I started to realize just how important the player's mind was. I and I hadn't really taken that into account to that extent that uh, we had before. We knew we wanted to make Amnesia. We had the idea of making the game as scary as possible. But scary is really like this abstract word. It can mean a lot of things. And in development, we actually thought about uh, what sort of s different scariness are there. And instead of then just thinking about scaring the player as much as possible, the thing was that we didn't want to evoke scariness as a general thing. Instead, what we thought about was various scenarios. So for instance, I thought about things like, okay, what if you're in a room and suddenly some creature um, emerges in this room and you have to hide and you have to hide in a closet and you want to stay in the closet and just peek outside and s try and understand where the monster is and what's happening out there and so on. So we wanted to create situations like that and evoke emotions that were connected to those events instead of just thinking about making it scary. So instead of just having a game, okay, let's make this as scary as possible. We thought, what is this scene? What is it we want to evoke with this specific scene? And then have a lot of focus on evoking those emotions as strongly as possible. And for company-wise, the major thing for us was that, well, now we're not just a company making horror games, now we're the company that messes with players' heads and like, does things to them in their experience. We're more like the, we don't make games as much, but we make experiences shaped like games. There's a positive and a negative thing, I, I guess, for that, that we had as a takeaway from Amnesia. Amnesia uh, had an incredibly important part in uh, influencing how we developed uh, Soma. There was tons of takeaways that we used uh, later on. So. First and foremost, it was how we shape the player experience. Like in Soma, we wanted the story to be about something a bit deeper than just scaring the player. And had we not done Amnesia before it, we would not have the ideas and even in some sense the language to speak about it, because at this point, we started to think about things in what's in the systems and what's in the player's mind and that sort of thing. Whereas before, system and player's mind was basically the same, but after the amnesia, we learned how to split them and we learned how to use that to our advantage. This was crucial for the development of Soma, where the players should start thinking about consciousness and about morality with robots and so on. And in order to achieve that, we had to have like a really strong understanding of what went through the player's head as they encountered different situations. The other way in which Amnesia inspired Soma was that we wanted Amnesia to be about deeper themes. Like we had this idea that it should be about what makes someone evil. And I didn't feel we got that across. So we got the scariness. We knew we had a tool in how to trick the player's mind here, but I didn't feel that we used that fully. So in making Soma, I wanted to like take a much larger focus on achieving the thematic things and then using lessons in Amnesia from doing that. So it's sort of interesting how I both felt Amnesia was a failure on one end, perhaps a bit a strong word, but I didn't think it exceeded in all that we intended to do with it. But at the same time, it taught us so much about how to make these sort of experiences. And had we done it, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do Soma at all. 
What we're working on now is taking the things that we learned from both Amnesia and Soma and pushing those ideas even further. How far into the minds of the players can we really reach and what sort of things can we invoke in them that other games have failed to do thus far?